some years ago, I was on the board of my college, and at one of the meetings, the president of the faculty announced that uh, his term had ended. This would be his last meeting. He said he took the job as president of the faculty because he felt an obligation, but he found that he enjoyed it. And he asked his wife one night, would you in your wildest dreams have thought that I would enjoy doing that? And she said, I hate to hurt your feelings, but you've never figured in my wildest dreams. <laughs> One of my wildest dreams is global health equity. Is there a cause for optimism? What's the role of philanthropy? And some lessons that have been learned. The cause for optimist, optimism, first of all, Every place on Earth is both local and global. Therefore, anything we do in the United States is already related to global health. The changes are so spectacular, it always surprises me that we can absorb them without being awe-stricken. In 1900, the single most important cause of death in this country was tuberculosis. And through a very persistent effort and lots of philanthropy, this no longer scares us. It's still a problem in much of the world, however. My father was born in 1905, and his life expectancy predicted that he would live until the early 1950s. He lived through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and he made it to this century. Why? Because in the United States, for an entire century, our life expectancy increased by seven hours a day. Think of that, seven hours a day. It's as if you never had to sleep. You just got seven hours every new day. So I grew up with the fear of polio, not the fear of tuberculosis. But then through the March of Dimes, which I see as a philanthropy of people in the aggregate, we saw the miracle of a press conference in April of 1955 at the University of Michigan and there was an announcement that said four words, safe, potent, and effective. And that's the way the SALT vaccine was introduced to the world. The field trials conducted by Tommy Francis required 1.8 million children, hundreds of thousands of volunteers in the medical community, in the education community, all before computers, and Tommy Francis had file cabinets up and down the halls at the University of Michigan, and he completed this study in less than two years. It's a miracle study and a medical milestone. So it's the face of philanthropy. But then a second milestone within weeks, because people began asking, what's the federal government going to do with this vaccine that works? The federal government was going to do nothing because Mrs. Hobby, the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, said she was opposed to anything that looked like socialized medicine, so she did not have a plan. President Eisenhower told her to develop a plan. And she had a press conference and announced she would seek an appropriation in order to buy vaccine for poor children. Senator Lister Hill then had a press conference and he said, no child will have to declare themselves poor to the world in order to benefit. I will seek an appropriation for vaccine for all children in this country. And that passed. And since then, the federal government has paid for vaccines for children in this country because it's seen as a social good. So yes, we can be optimistic. 10 years later, Lyndon B. Johnson then proclaimed the US would help with global smallpox eradication for the same reason, that it was a social good. The Americas had been decimated by smallpox. And in Europe, if you read the history, it's just amazing how many people had smallpox or died from smallpox. Voltaire had smallpox, and he estimated at that time that 30% of all Europeans would have smallpox during their lifetime. He said a third would die, a third would end up scarred, and only a third would get away scot-free. But it wasn't just Voltaire. Mozart had smallpox, his sister had smallpox, Hayden had smallpox, Louis XV died of smallpox, Lady Montague had smallpox. The change in history because of this one disease, 300 million deaths last century, 
and now it's gone. It's been 40 years since the last case. When I first went to India 56 years ago, what I saw was what I expected from Europe in the 19th century. Lots of people had smallpox scars. Now you go to India and you see no one under the age of 40 with pock marks. Measles used to kill three million children a year when I started in this business. And if you can imagine three million couples now with an empty place at the dinner table each year. That figure has gone from three million to two million to one million down to about 100,000 a year. Still too high, but the great progress has been made. When I started, 50,000 children under the age of five would die every day in the world. That figure went down to 40,000, 30,000, and it continues to drop. Malaria, we're starting to see a true decrease in deaths around the world. And blindness in Africa has changed completely thanks to Merck Drug Company for giving a free drug. So the good news just continues to accumulate. What's the role of philanthropy? Well, if you look at what people traditionally called global health, they were thinking of tropical medicine and countries in the tropics. And there have been many chapters, church-sponsored programs that started in the early 19th century. The colonial powers, particularly Britain and France, the military, because they wanted to maintain health in their troops. Then the foundations 100 years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation, global agencies after the Second World War, WHO and UNICEF and CARE and UNDP, bilateral programs, USAID, and counter programs in Canada and Sweden and Denmark and so forth. And then non-governmental organizations, first by the dozens, then by the hundreds, now by the thousands. And academic programs, in the last 20 years, they've become very interested in global health. All of these have components of philanthropy. And then the corporations became involved with the big change being Merck's entering the field. New political programs. The Carter Center has brought together politics and going directly to heads of state with global health. New foundations, the Gates Foundation. A public interest because of fear of Ebola, Zika. So some of the highlights around those programs. In the beginning when the churches got involved in medical mission work, Livingston was actually writing home asking for doctors to keep the missionaries alive. But soon, hospitals and clinics became such magnets that they continued to grow. And some of those hospitals have been going for 150 years. The Clara Swain Hospital in Bareilly, India, was started by the first woman physician to be sent to the mission field. The colonial powers, I mentioned that uh, France and England started big programs that still exist in their former colonies. And foundations. 100 years ago, Rockefeller left a legacy getting involved in hookworm eradication in this country, and then the first school of public health at Johns Hopkins. They became interested in yellow fever vaccine and started a program in Nigeria. They lost three of their scientists to yellow fever before they finally isolated a virus and they were able to send it back to New York, changing the ice continuously, and developed what is now the vaccine used around the world, 17D yellow fever vaccine. And Max Thieler, who worked for the Rockefeller Foundation, got a Nobel Prize. The Rockefeller Foundation got a second Nobel Prize in 1970 when Norman Borlaug, working on agriculture, got a prize for the Green Revolution in India and Pakistan. Post-war, as all of these programs were developing, WHO is a particular example, an essential organization developed by people of good intention but flawed ideas. In the United States, we insisted on three things, that the regional offices had to be very strong because we were trying to protect the Pan American Health Organization here in Washington, D.C. Those regional offices became so strong that they can undermine Geneva anytime they want. We also insisted on a board of directors of the ministers of health around the world. So there are now 195 members. I can't imagine a CEO running a company in this country if they had to have 195 people on the board. 
And these are people that turn over all the time, that two or three years, and then they're off to some other uh, position. And the third thing, the countries have insisted every year that WHO reduce its budget. One year, the United States was not paying its dues to WHO, and I wrote an editorial, and I quoted Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton said, you'd be surprised how much it costs to look this cheap. <laughs> and the ninth, uh, 2014 outbreak of Ebola in West Africa showed how much it cost for us to be that cheap. USAID, again, a great idea, a good intention, but we put it in the State Department so we're always tempted to use politics in making medical decisions. Corporations. Wyeth developed a needle for vaccinating against smallpox, and what did they do? They gave the patent of that needle to the World Health Organization. But the real change in what happened with corporations came with Merck. Merck had developed a drug to use in heartworm in dogs. It's a complicated story. This was developed from a soil sample taken from a golf course in Japan, worked on in this country, and it protected dogs against heartworm. Then someone got the idea, might it protect humans from onchocerciasis, a similar organism that causes river blindness in West Africa? Merck did the studies and found out, indeed, it did protect against onchocerciasis, but it was even better in humans than in dogs. You only had to give it once a year. So it was a relatively cheap drug given once a year to the poorest people in the world. Merck could not make a profit on it. They offered it free to WHO if WHO would figure out a way to deliver it. And WHO became so bureaucratic, Merck finally walked away. They offered it to USAID and USAID saved them a lot of trouble by just saying no. And then they offered it to the task force in Atlanta. And we figured out a way to distribute it. And they have now distributed over one billion free treatments of this drug against onchocerciasis in Africa. And the blindness rates are going down. Then we saw the politics. When the Carter Center got involved, President Carter would go directly to heads of state, and he would tell them about the diseases. The head of state would get the Minister of Health interested, of course. And so now the Carter Center has been working on guinea worm eradication, on onchocerciasis or river blindness, on trachoma, another blindness condition, and on lymphatic filariasis, which causes elephantiasis in people. And they've worked on agriculture. But he's also gotten African leaders involved. So General Toure from Mali and General Gawan from Nigeria have both worked in health programs thanks to President Carter. But the real game changer occurred 20 years ago when the Gates Foundation was started. 62 years ago, I was in Seattle attending medical school and I was looking for someone interested in global health. I could only find one person, Ray Ravenholt. I started working for him after school and on Saturdays, and he said, if you're really interested in global health, go to Atlanta, join CDC, and get in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. And it turned out to be such good advice. And so the Gates Foundation has brought Seattle from a place where I could only find one person interested in global health to a place where the University of Washington and lots of other groups are working on global health. I need to tell you one story about Bill Gates to let you know what philanthropy really means to him. January 2000, six foundations had a meeting in Seattle asking, is there any light at the end of the tunnel for AIDS? At that time, people in Africa were dying faster than they could be replaced. This was true in the medical professions, this was tr true in church groups and education groups, dying faster than they could be replaced. So these six foundations met to ask, could we discover something that is worth investing in? We came up with six ideas. 
And the job was that I was supposed to present these to Bill Gates and the other five foundations would also present these to their uh, corporate structure. I went to Bill Gates' office and it turned out to be a disastrous meeting because as we went into the office, he was showing us a grant request and he said, I've told you before, I never want to see anything like this again. A grant request that was a bottomless pit. If he invested this year, he would have to invest next year. And as he went down the list of things he never wanted to see again, I knew those were the things we were in asking him for. So I went ahead and started through, told him that six ideas had come up, went through the first five and he stopped me and he said, how much money are you talking about? And I said, we were talking about $500 million a year for 10 years. That's not a small amount of money. But his immediate reaction was, oh, it will take more than that. That gave me the courage to go to number six, which had to do with orphans and AIDS in Africa. And his response was, if you're gonna worry about AIDS in Africa, you have to worry about those orphans. I rode back from that meeting to the foundation with his father. And I asked his father, can you tell me what just happened? He told us he never wanted to see anything like that. And in 20 minutes, he approved all six approaches. And his father said, he's a business person. He knows what he wants from his investment. But when faced with the human condition, he'll try to make the right decision. That's what philanthropy is about. When I talk to students these days about all the great things, tool, new tools and so forth, I tell them about Robert Brault who once said, as to the seven deadly sins, I deplore pride, wrath, lust, envy, and greed, but I pretty much plan my day around gluttony and sloth. <laughs> as I talk to these students, I've added one more thing to that list, envy. To think of being a young student getting into global health today with better tools and better resources, more interest, uh, is just more than I can imagine. And we've learned a lot of lessons. We've learned that everything that happens, happens with a coalition. And the best coalitions have followed certain rules. That instead of saying, we're interested in doing this, what's the next step? They all start with, what's the last step? What does the last mile look like? When will we know that we've succeeded? And once they come up with that statement, then they can go back to what's the next step. They also have to learn ego suppression. And they also have to find substitutes for turf guarding. And they have to choose people who have four characteristics. They're problem solvers. They have absolute integrity. They are sensitive to other cultures and they are optimistic. How do you find those people? Well, the usual way of finding a person is you look at their CV, you interview them, and you talk to their supervisor. Problem is you never know why the supervisor is giving them a good rating. And they may be trying to get rid of them, but you can find out all four of these things if you call someone that that candidate has supervised. So talk to one of the people that worked under them and they know immediately whether they're problem solvers, whether they have integrity, whether they're sensitive to other cultures and whether they're optimistic. So if you require pessimism, contract out for it, never hire those people. <laughs> and we've learned that it's a cause and effect world. Stephen Hawking said the story of the world is the gradual real realization that things do not happen in an arbitrary way. So improvements don't happen by chance. They require a plan. And know the truth, you can't change things until you know the truth. Next, we have learned the limits of science. Certainty, as physicist Richard Feynman said, is the Achilles heel of business, religion, science, medicine, politics. Voltaire said, doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. There is something better than science, and that is uncertain science. Science with a moral compass, science in the service of equity, science used to protect the future. And the power of science is not in its, is not in its existence, 
it's in its application. The need for optimism, I keep coming back to, because Harlan Cleveland, who was ambassador to NATO in the late 60s, became interested in global health late in life, and he said the fuel of global health is unwarranted optimism. Well, now it's warranted. We can see the changes. So be willing to think centuries ahead and always be thinking globally. William Penn, the Quaker leader, said to heal the world is true religion. That can be our goal. A final point, James Thurber, the humorist from the last century, was attending a reception one night and a woman introduced herself as an American now living in Paris. And she said, you know, they put your articles in French and they're even funnier in French. And he said, yes, they tend to lose something in the original. <laughs> so science loses something in the original. It has to be applied. And philanthropy has been a potent force in getting our science used for the benefit of the poor around the world. Thank you so much.